Welcome. We're glad you found this recorded presentation by the Knox County Master Gardeners. We are a volunteer community service group affiliated with the University of Tennessee, as well as Tennessee State University and their cooperative extension programs. The mission of the Knox County Master Gardener program is to educate and serve the community using research-based information on best practices in horticulture, environmental stewardship, and integrated pest management. One of the ways we educate is through our Speakers Bureau. We normally present to live audiences four times a month, with two topics being presented twice, once on a Saturday at a county branch library and a repeat on a weekday at a county senior center. But with COVID-19, these are not normal times. During May, all four of our regular county venues were closed. The duration of those closures is expected to be eight weeks. And because of our affiliation with the University of Tennessee, we are banned from any public gathering of any size until August 1. So after sitting on the sidelines during April and May, we have found an alternate way to present the talks that we had on the schedule for June and July. It is likely that we will continue this alternate delivery method in August. We hope to be back in front of live audiences for September and October, and if we are, we plan to record those sessions. If group gatherings of up to 50 people are still prohibited, we will complete our planned schedule using this new format. On the slide, you see our web website address and a portion of our website homepage. The website provides information on Knox County Master Gardener projects and activities, and includes a calendar of events. All of our Speakers Bureau talks are on this calendar and include the name of the presenter, the topic, and a brief description. For the talks given in this alternative method, you will also find the link to where the recorded presentation can be found. Thanks again for finding this particular recording. And now, let's get started with the actual presentation. Hello, my name is Marsha Lehman, and today we'll be talking about verma composting. That's simply another word for saying composting with worms. You may also hear the term vermiculture, but that's simply those folks who grow worms, probably selling them as bait to local fishing and tackle stores. But we're going to focus on verma composting, that is, using worms to compost our kitchen scraps. Why would we compost with worms? Let's start with the benefits. The benefits are much like that of traditional composting where the worm compost, the vermicompost, provides nutrients to the soil, increases the soil's ability to hold those nutrients in a form that plants can easily take up. Along the way, it also improves soil structure, um, increases the aeration and internal drainage. And for those of us who have heavy clay soils here in East Tennessee, that is a definite benefit. If you happen to have sandy soil or you have some pots that have a lot of sand in them, it will increase the water holding ability. And along the way in this verma composting process, we acquire a bunch of beneficial bacteria that are also good for the soil. So benefits are much like those of traditional composting. There are a couple of disadvantages. One is, if you have a large garden or a lot of containers, worm composting is done on a much smaller scale than traditional composting. If you, if you recall in traditional composting, we usually recommend that you have a pile that's at least three feet wide by three feet high, a three by three, one, one cubic yard if, effectively. Worm composting is done on a much smaller scale than that. Now, if you live in a condo or an apartment, that's not a disadvantage, that's actually an advantage. So 
if you're a condo or apartment dweller, you can do worm composting because it doesn't take as much space as traditional composting. The other disadvantage, perhaps, is that it takes time. So one must be patient at, at several steps in the process, but not least of which is the time it takes to create the worm compost. And we'll explain that as we go along. So what do you need to get started? Well, you're going to need a bin of some sort and you can buy one. There are lots available and I would start it on Amazon, which is where most of us probably start. Or you can make your own and we'll talk a little bit about what you need to make your own worm bin. As for the worms, you're going to have to purchase them. That or you have to uh, learn what you're looking for and go out perhaps and forage in the forest for them, but it's just easier to purchase them. The local bait shops probably have them, but in very small quantity containers. So that's probably more expensive than, than going online and finding a worm farm or starting on Amazon and find some worms to purchase. The bedding, the stuff that you put in the bins to make a happy home for these worms, you have around the house already, along with the food that you're going to add for them to eat. Um, you need a little bit of shade or basement. Worms do their job best when the temperatures are between 55 and 80. And when it gets colder than 55 or hotter than 80, you want, you want to think about them. It's not going to kill them. But just know that they will either slow down or change their behavior a bit. Um, and their preferred range is 55 to 80. And then there's that thing of it takes time and a little bit of patience. So should you do a DIY, make your own bin versus buy a worm farm or a product that's often called a worm factory? And that's what you see here on the right. You'll notice there are multiple tiers here. So there's one, two, three, four tiers to this worm farm. And this diagram shows you that you have a bottom level here that can collects the leachate, which is the liquid that will accumulate. And I would advise you that if you, you can use that leachate, but be sure to dilute it before you apply it directly to plants. Anyway, moving up, the general process is you would fill this bin with bedding and food and put your worms in there. That's where you get started. When this bin is filled with kitchen scraps, then you would add the next tier, add some a little bit of bedding and more kitchen scraps food. And then when that is full, you fill this bin. And you can get these with tiers ranging from three. Uh, the unit I purchased has five. And the general recommendation is not to exceed seven levels. Now, what's going on here, a bit of a sidebar, is you're probably producing more kitchen scraps faster than the worms can eat it. So that's why you need multiple tiers. So you, you fill this one, you fill this one, you fill this one, and depending on how fast you're filling those, you may, if you're lucky, have this bottom tier be about done by the time you have finished filling the top one. So you take these tiers apart, you would pull this one out, harvest it. This one then becomes the bottom. This is the second the bottom. This one's been emptied and it goes back on top. Bit of a sidebar, but that'll make a little more sense when we talk about some of the things you need to think about if you make your own bin. So let's come over here to this side. While the worm factory is gonna, going to cost you about $100 or so, you can make your own bin for somewhere between $5 and $25, depending on the number of tiers that you put in your system. I would suggest that you need two, as a minimum, bins. And obviously, when you buy the bin, you also buy a lid. So we're talking about the 
typical storage tote that you see in a big box store. The names that you might recognize would be Sterilite or Rubbermaid. Um, recommendation is no smaller than a 10 gallon bin, but don't go larger than a 20 gallon bin. Because if you go larger than a 20 gallon bin, you will end up with something that's way too heavy to lift. So you need at least two bins and lids to get started. They need to be colored because earthworms do not like the sun. Don't buy any of the clear or opaque bins that you may see usually advertised for storing gift wrapping paper and, and ribbons and so that type of supply. You want a colored bin, and I would just say the dark gray or black is your best option. One bin, if you start with two, one bin will need quarter inch holes in the bottom for drainage. That same bin will need a whole bunch of holes for aeration because the worms are going to need to breathe. So you would take the lid and put at least 30 small ventilation holes. We'll go into more detail on that. And then the second bin has no holes in it. It is used to collect any liquid. So the second bin would be the equivalent of this bottom tier that collects the leachate in the worm factory. You don't have that. You also know that when you set two bins together, they compress very nicely. So you want to stick a couple pieces of PVC piping or a little, you know, a couple pieces of a two by four scrap wood in the bottom of the bin so that the one with the holes and the worms doesn't fall all the way to the bottom of the one that's collecting the liquid. Perhaps this will make more sense as we move on. So here we go. Those quarter inch holes in the bottom of the bin, this, this looks like it's a square container. Most of the containers I've seen are actually rectangular, so I would take and drill five holes across and 10 holes down in a row all a quarter of an inch. Those are drain holes, but they are also used if you go more than two bins and start stacking them up. Those are the holes that the worms will crawl through to move from one tier up into the next tier. So again, back with assuming that you've got two bins, all of the holes are in the top bin, no holes in the bottom bin. In addition to the Big holes in the bottom, the quarter inch holes, you'll notice there are itty bitty little holes drilled all the way around this edge. Those are one eighth inch holes around the top edge. And then what you can't see is there are additional holes in the lid. And again, these are the one eighth inch holes. They are to provide air to the earthworms. Okay, so here's a a situation where they've got two bins and I can tell by the way they're stacked that this has food and bedding in it, this has food and bedding in it, and they don't have a place to collect the leachate. So I would actually have a third bin, the bottom bin, under here to collect leachate. So if you have two bins, all the holes are in the top bin, no holes in the bottom because that's collecting liquid. If you have three bins, then two of the bins have all of these holes. But again, the bottommost bin does not. And you want to put something in that bottommost bin to keep the upper bins from settling down in and getting so soaking, so soaking wet, excuse me, uh, from the leachate that is collecting in that bottommost bin. So again, this can be a fun project to get kids involved in measuring. Um, laying out those five holes across, ten holes down. These holes are about an inch apart, so teaching them how to use a measuring tape. There's all sorts of instructional opportunities here for children. So, whether you purchased the worm factory, the worm farm, or you made your own bins, now you need to collect and prepare the bedding. 
And again, as in traditional composting, the bedding needs to be as moist as a damp sponge. So it should feel damp, but you shouldn't be able to wring any water out of it. You can use shredded newsprint because most of that is now printed with inks made of soy. Plain cardboard, shredded again. Uh, if, if you purchase a lot of things from Amazon, you obviously have been collecting a lot of brown packing paper. If you happen to have any coconut core or peat moss left over from other gardening projects, you can use that. You can also use chopped dry leaves. And getting started, fill the food bin about one third of the way with moist bedding. Now we get to the actual worms. These are not your typical garden worms. These are red wigglers and their botanical name is Isenia fetida. They are small red worms that generally live in the top layer of organic matter on top of the soil. So think about walking into the forest where you've got a nice layer of dropped leaves lying on top of the soil. That's where you will find these red wigglers. They are not in the soil, they are in the organic matter that is on top of the soil. If you've got a barn, um, they will, you can also find them in barn litter. And if you've left a pile of garden waste somewhere, um, you may find them there. But again, they'll be in the waste. They will not be in the soil. Red wigglers are preferred for this type of composting because it's easy for us to replicate the environment that they like in either our DIY bin or a purchase bin. They're also ideal because they have relatively short lifespans. And to make up for that, they reproduce quickly and they tolerate a wide range of conditions. So if you had a, a, a red wiggler that was a year old, that's an old codger because generally their lifespan is a little less than a year. Um, one year is really a long life for a red wiggler. Now, since they have such a short lifespan, they reach sexual maturity at about 60 days, and at that point they start to reproduce. So short life, active sex life. Again, red wigglers are not as big as the typical earthworms that we find in the soil. And if you look at the picture here, this palm full of red wigglers, if you had that many traditional earthworms, you, you'd probably have to have your other hand up there cupping them. A thousand red wigglers weigh about one pound and they eat half of their weight daily. Now, kids are like this. Earthworms do not have teeth. Instead, they have a gizzard, which is also what birds have. So they like to have some gritty material that you're feeding them to help them pulverize the food that they're eating. Um, it appears that the price of worms has gone up. When I purchased my worms in 2013, uh, I got 500 worms for about $20, and now that $20 will only get me about 250 worms, plus shipping and handling. And the easiest and best way to do it is simply to order them online. So here we go. Now we're gonna add what we call garbage, but they call lunch, because this is where the kitchen scraps go at my household. I do lots of traditional composting with leaves and grass clippings and the like, but my kitchen scraps all go to my worm bin. So what are we feeding them? Well, we're feeding them fruit and vegetable scraps, all those peelings, eggshells. This is where they get their grit for their gizzard. And it helps if you take that eggshell and crush it up into smaller pieces, because again, they don't have teeth. Plain cereal, bread, pasta, coffee grounds. 
I mean, and you can put the coffee filter in there too, because that's just a, a lightweight paper, but they love coffee grounds. You can take that um, science project that you found in the back of the refrigerator called spoiled food. They will eat spoiled food. They don't care. You can take your dryer lint, provided that it's not synthetic, it's not polyester. So if you've put something through the, the dryer that was wool or a whole load of cotton t-shirts, yep, that dryer lint can go in there. Cardboard and newspaper can go in there once it's been shredded into smaller pieces. And stop feeding, stop adding to that bin when it's two thirds full. And part of that is just, once it's two thirds full, that bin is really pretty heavy. On the right side, we see the things not to feed them, but not putting these things in your worm composting bin is not always because they don't like it, but for the same reason that we don't put some of these things in our traditional composting. The meat, the oil, the dairy, that's all because those will attract other critters that we don't want. It's why we don't put them in traditional composting and it's largely why we don't put them in our worm composting. Now worms, while they'll eat almost anything, they don't like large amounts of onion and they don't like acidic foods. So, you know, don't throw that lemon or lime peel into your worm bin. And again, no pet feces. So once that bin is full, you're gonna look in there and you're gonna say, well, gee, but there's, I still see a lot of worms. Yep, that's because there is still food in there and the worms, even in the worm factory with multiple tiers, they will not move up as long as there is a single bite of food left in a lower tier. So there are times when you'll say, well, there's only a couple of worms left in this tier. It's, it, and I need, I need the worm compost for my gardening. So you'll go ahead and you'll harvest the worm compost, pull those few random worms out, toss them in the next tier or into your next bin. Um, but you're, you, you fed this bottom bin until it's full. Then you start adding food to the next bin or tier up. In the meantime, those worms are still feeding on that bottom bin. And so it may take three months from the time that you stopped putting something in that bottom bin until you're actually ready to harvest it, that there's no food or bedding left in there because they eat the food you put in there, those kitchen scraps, and they eat the bedding. Now, along the way, three months is a long time. Don't be surprised if you see centipedes. Don't be surprised if you see soldier flies and soldier fly larvae. Those are actually some good guys. But if you were thinking that the only thing that's going to be in your worm bin is worms, well, no, be prepared to see a few other critters. But most of them are good. So now you've got this worm compost, the finished product, which looks a lot like coffee grounds when it starts to dry out. It's also called worm castings, and that's just a polite word or a polite term for worm poop. So how do we get the worms separated from the compost? Well, if you purchase the worm factory, that's a definite advantage because as you feed the higher and higher tiers, the earthworms will eventually move up. It's also easier if you have more than two tiers and you don't fill them quite as full. But let me tell you one process you probably don't want to use, unless you have a lot of children around who want to help you with this project. It's a good classroom project, but not particularly efficient if your goal is to simply get worm castings for your, for your garden or potted plants. The most basic thing you can do is take a bin or a tier that is finished, get a tarp, lay it out in the sunshine, and dump that bin or that tier onto the tarp. 
earthworms do not like sunlight. So the first thing they will do is head down into the pile. If there were any worms on the surface of that pile that you dumped out, they're gonna burrow down in. So you dump your, your bin or your tear out on this tarp that's out in the sunshine and then go get a cup of coffee. Come back about 30 minutes later, scrape off the top because all the earthworms have gone down a ways, scrape down the top until, until you start to find earthworms again. Once you start to see earthworms, go get a, you know, stir up the pile a little bit, go get another cup of coffee. Come back in about 30 minutes, the worms will have gone south again. Scrape off some more until you find how deep the earthworms went. Then go get another beverage. Come back 30 minutes later and you get the picture. That is a very time consuming, tedious process, but it's one that kids might actually enjoy. But the easier way is if you don't fill your bins as full or you use something like a worm factory where each tier is about four inches deep, you tend to be able to take, dump that out, pick out the few worms that are still there, toss them in the next bin, and you're ready to go use your, your worm castings. But it's a good educational experience to do it the, the, the long, tedious, manual way just to get some understanding of what earthworms like and don't like. And one of the things we learned is they do not like sunlight, which jumping back is why we use the black or dark colored bins. So the worms get reused, but a year from now, the worms that you have are not the same worms you had last year. They simply reproduced. And when they do that, they actually lay eggs. So this picture in the bottom right hand corner is someone has picked out the little pearly beads, which are actually uh, eggs of earthworms. So if you see these in your compost, know that they're going to hatch and you can get three or four little earthworms out of every one of these egg sacs. But don't be surprised when you see these in your in your bin. It just means your earthworms have been reproducing. Another little interesting tidbit is that I, I mentioned that earthworms really like it between 55 and 80. So in the winter time, they slow down a bit. For me, that's about Thanksgiving time. And so I, I've act, actually stopped putting food in the bins during the middle of winter. And instead I take bagged leaves and pile it all around my worm bin to insulate it. And if the worms really think they're gonna die of the cold, the first thing they do is lay eggs. And the egg is not susceptible to freezing. So the egg will lay there all during the winter. And when it warms up in the spring, then it will hatch and you're off and running again with a new batch of worms. So I've had my same worms or my same worm bin since 2013. I have never had to buy additional worms. And at the same time, I've been able to give worms to other people to start their worm bins. And so the, the worms are kind of self-regulating in their population. If, they're, if they get too crowded, then they don't reproduce as much. And if their population declines, well, then they get busy, lay eggs, and make some more worms. So the worms, you think you have the same worms, but no, their lifespan is about a year, but they keep reproducing and they self-regulate their population. So what are we gonna do with this worm compost or this, these worm castings? Why did we go through all this? Well, we did it to get some really good stuff. Worm castings are a great soil amendment. They're the ultimate and slow release fertilizer. And compared to ordinary soil, they have five times more nitrogen, seven times more phosphorus, and 11 times more potassium. So if you are making up a potting mix 
for a container, you can use one part of worm compost to three or four parts of your potting mix. Um, you can also use your worm castings to brew compost tea and then apply as a soil drench or use it to water your plants and give them that, in, uh, that additional nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium for those bigger blooms and stronger, healthier plants. So let's just wrap up here a bit. Worm composting is small scale compared to traditional composting. It can be a fun project for children and for adults. If you're not sure you really want to invest a hundred plus dollars in a commercially available worm factory, then try the, the do-it-yourself bins. The, the, they make a good test run and they're another good project to get children involved in making the actual bin. Um, worm composting follows many of the same guidelines as traditional composting with the no meat, dairy, and fat. Worms will eat almost anything, but they don't like spicy or tart. During their happy season of 55 to 80 degrees, they will eat half their weight daily. They do slow down in the winter time. They'll eat less and lay eggs, which will then hatch in the spring when it warms up. The worm castings are great amendments for your potted plants. Compost tea made with worm castings can be applied as a soil drench. And that, that fun little tidbit that worms have a gizzard. So if we've piqued your interest, there are a few books available in the library. The first one here, Worms Eat My Garbage, is actually a book written for children, but it's an easy read for adults and goes through all the basic steps of how to get it set up, how to maintain it, how to diagnose what's going wrong, if things go wrong. Um, a couple other books here also available in the library. And then if you are doing some internet searches, the folks at Clemson, their extension service has a, a really good article on worm composting. Washington State University has a good one on composting with red worms, which is what they call red wigglers. And so does the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. So I'll leave these up on the, on, for you to, to take a screen grab or to jot down a few notes. And with that, I thank you for joining me today, and I hope you give some thought to starting a worm bin, whether you make your own or buy one. It's a, if you're in a relatively small household where you don't have enough kitchen scraps to do traditional composting, you might find worm composting to be a good alternative for you. Again, thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and that you learned something that will help you in your gardening endeavors. Whether that means more blooms on your flowers and ornamental shrubs, attracting more pollinators to your garden, or improving your vegetable production. As we were not able to field your questions today, we want to close by offering you some ways to reach us. As you can see on this slide, we have a presence on Facebook. You may post questions to either of these Facebook pages. Feel free to upload a photo, especially if it helps to describe the problem you have. If you are not a Facebook user, you may call the Extension Office at 865-215-2340 and leave a detailed message with your question. Your question will be forwarded to a Master Gardener to research and respond to you. You may also send an email to Ryland Thompson, the Knox County Extension agent who advises the local Master Gardener program. If a photo would help to describe the problem, feel free to attach one or two. Try to keep the total attachments to less than five megabytes. You may get a response directly from Ryland, or he may route your question to a Master Gardener to research and respond to you. We are eager to return to public presentations. In the meantime, you can watch any of our recorded presentations by going to our website, finding a Speakers Bureau event on the calendar, 
and clicking on the link that is included within the event details. Now, let's go get some dirt under our fingernails. <laughs> 